Hi, I'm so excited to uh, introduce our next speaker. It is Dr. Luke Colmont with Stop Darm Conquer. He is the founder and the managing director of this nonprofit. And so we're so excited to have you here with us today. And we'd love to kick it off by you sharing a little bit about the organization that you founded. Well, I'm a gastroenterologist and I've been working for nearly 30 years in the hospital. And I saw too many patients in our hospital, a middle, middle-sized hospital, university hospital in the center of Antwerp in Belgium. We saw at least uh, seven new cases each month. So I think that's quite a lot. And the other thing that was, I noticed that a lot of patients didn't know anything about colon cancer. They didn't know anything about the story of the little polyp. They didn't know anything about the time between a polyp and cancer. They didn't even know that there's a simple test of the stool that you can do. So I think it was my task, my duty to informate and educate people about this disease. And in 2010, I was quite lucky to, to meet three young guys, three students of high school, 17 years old. And we start to, together an action group, Stop Dagenkanke. After two years, it became an NGO. And uh, now we're working now since six years, I left the hospital and I'm working full-time for our organization. Wow, that's great. And if people are interested in learning more about your organization, how can they find you? Well, they can Google my name, <laughs> then they will find quite a lot of things on Stop Darren Kanke. It's a, it's a Dutch um, name, we are a, a Belgian, NGO, and I don't like the term, the term um, non-profit, since I think yes. it's a social profit. It's social yes. profit. I think that we can, we can, um, we always think we can save lives, that's true, but we can avoid a lot of misery. And that's very, very important too. And we can make money for the government. If we detect cancer in early stage and we can avoid these expensive treatments, that's good for everyone. So I really believe it's a win-win-win situation. And we have to inform people, we have to educate people. And in my opinion, that's the first step before screening and prevention, information and education. Dr. Coleman, I would love to, to hear from you if you could share with our viewers uh, an example of grassroots advocacy efforts that maybe one that you're most proud of or um, and any lessons that you've learned from that experience? Well, one of the most important lessons that I have learned from now more than 10 years campaigning is that you have to campaign and not only during the International Colon Cancer Awareness Month, but you have to campaign every day. Uh, colon cancer is attacking every day. So we have to counter attack every day. We do this on social media. We use the social media. For me, it's not a duty, but it's an opportunity to use social media. It's free. Uh, you can. You are responsible for the content yourself. And we have a Facebook page where we now, for more than ten years, are posting every day, every day. Wow. Um, and we have okay. We have an audience of uh, one hundred thirty-five people, one hundred thirty-five thousand people who follow us. And that's not so bad for a, a small. NGO in a little country like Belgium, but we do it every day, consistent. It should be um, from a scientific point of view, and therefore I'm a, med a physician. It should be also correct. You, uh, it's not, it's not a, a game. You don't have to play with it, but you can informate and educate your people in, in many ways. And one of my, one of the quotes that I've heard several times is that. The best campaign is the one that is done and not the one that is discussed for many years and in the end is not done. Yes. And when I'm giving keynotes, I ask my audience who quoted this. And then sometimes I hear people saying Churchill and others say Kennedy and mm -hmm. others say Einstein and other people say Obama. And <laughs> whether somebody is saying Obama, another one say Trump. And then I show the next slide with the one who quoted this, I quoted this, it's my quote. I don't believe that there is the ideal campaign. Yeah. Okay, there are campaigns that we are proud of that we did. Uh, several years ago, I wrote a letter to Brad Pitt and that became a, 
a viral campaign. He never answered. That was not a problem. Yeah. But we created a lot of buzz and many people saw this. And this year, with the fifth anniversary of Elon Musk, uh, we also sent him a special gift. And um, we bought a small place on Mars, uh, since he wants to live there. And um, so that he can have his own toilet, Elon's toilet. And also on social media, this, this created a lot of buzz. And that's one of the ways that um, you can use. But I don't believe that there's the ideal campaign. Sometimes it should be more informative. Sometimes it might be emotional, but um, it's, there's no one campaign that will uh, uh, hit every people. Yeah, will, absolutely. Yeah. And it was very exciting when I saw um, the, the uh, real estate on Mars and it you know, being reserved for his uh, bathroom or his toilet rather, I thought, this is this is really this is really smart. This is a, a great campaign. Um, so let me ask you. I think it's incredible how often you are posting on social media, and I think many organizations and advocates uh, want to be spreading the message as often as you are, but sometimes struggle to find content. So how does that work, and what does that look like as far as planning ahead? And are you sharing other people's content or is it entirely original content? That's a, that's a lot of posting to do. Um, so how, how do you manage that? Well, I think it's 90% uh, is original uh, things that we are doing. We are campaigning the whole year round to uh, actions that we are doing. Uh, sometimes we also um, post uh, other things than, than colon cancer since people should know that um, there is a life next to colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So when something important happens with the national soccer team, then we are very smart and very first to, to post it. And you see a lot of reactions also to that. So, um, but 95% of the, the content is related to the problem of colon cancer. Um, and a lot of imaging, I think it's quite important to use mm -hmm. images. I'm, I'm one, someone who is thinking in images. I always ask people, when you are dreaming, what do you see? Do you see images or do you see text? When I'm dreaming, I see images. So use images. And the famous uh, quote, one image says more than a thousand words. It's, it's true. Um, it can be related to the test. It can be related to the national screening program patient stories. Uh, we have people who send their own story to our um, organization and we put them on our website, testimonials, something about food, uh, new drugs that are found. Um, there is content enough. And sometimes, okay, there's not, no problem to look to your other, other organizations, what they are posting, and that can inspire yourself too. Absolutely. And I, I think that you're, you're um, right about images being so powerful. And, you know, a lot of times we'll see people are posting uh, and want to share facts about colon cancer. So, it, you know, in the screening or treatment realm. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the facts might not always be correct. Uh, so now you're in a unique position with uh, your medical background of, I'm sure, being able to um, give the, the stamp of approval that this is accurate information. Do you have any advice for advocates who want to share information but aren't sure if it's a reputable source where they're, they're getting the information? How, how, do, how would one handle that? Well, I think that if uh, someone who has not the, the same medical background that, that I have or for other people have, that they should check it. And um, that should probably should have someone on the board who's looking to the content and if you are not sure about a, a certain number that you first check it otherwise the credibility of your organization it's not good for your credibility of your organization and i think there is enough sites where you can find very good information so i think it's quite important to check it one of the other things that we keep always do two lines in mind and I think that's very, very specific. And everything what we are doing on social media, 
we keep we try to keep this between two lines. What if the thing that we are posting is seen or is read or is heard by someone who is in full treatment? And what happens when what we are posting is seen, is read, is listened by something who lost someone who lost his father or mother a few weeks ago of colon cancer? These two things, these two lines, we try always to stay within. And probably in 10 years, one time I touched the line because we, we used a cartoon that probably was not, I don't think I would post it today, but mm -hmm. that's the only thing that we, we touch the line. And that's every, everything we do, these two lines we keep into our mind. That's so important. What a great, what a great tip. And speaking of the social media, so I'm wondering if there are organizations or advocates that are interested and motivated to say, wow, I, I want to post as, as often, you know, and, and have that engagement that you have, how much of a time commitment would you say it is? Because I imagine um, that being responsive is important. So it's, if you put a campaign out there and there's a lot of people commenting, asking questions, that engagement is important for people to see that you are responding to their questions or liking their comments. How much of a time commitment would you say that it is for an organization that has over 130,000 people that are, are seeing potentially what you're posting? Well, I think um, it, it takes time. And uh, an hour a day, two hours a day, I think, would, will be enough to, to manage this since there are also many other things that an organization has to do. But if you do it a little bit in the morning, if you do it a little bit in the afternoon and probably before, before you go home, then you can manage these things. Um, since the beginning of the COVID crisis in 2020, um, I started every Wednesday at five o'clock in the afternoon with a Facebook Live. And yesterday, I did my, I think we're now over 120 wow. um, episodes. And that's every time 15 to 20 minutes. And it's really five o'clock, it's live. People can ask me questions and I try to answer them directly. So they have the feeling that it's, it's, it's live. Yeah. They're sitting at home, they're typing. I see the question coming up. I try to answer. And that creates a real engagement that people people like and appreciate, and that we see also on the on the comments. The day one or the, two days after, I try to also answer this uh, on the on the Facebook page. Another thing that I think it's quite important that we are active on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, and on Facebook. Not yet TikTok. Probably we will start to do this, but. Um, I'm not sure whether I should do this, but it's another, <laughs> another, another channel to get information. But since what we notice that the people, the overlap between the audience of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn is not that great. You are reaching different group of people and the content sometimes differs a little bit but we are active on the, on the four uh, social medias. And do you utilize different content or do, are there different, I mean, obviously there are different character limits for certain platforms, you know, you utilize uh, more hashtags perhaps, but is, would you say that you have um, a different approach when it comes to what's posted or is it the same? No, I don't content? think we, we just, we just adjust the, the same post Mm -hmm. to the uh, uh, specific type of uh, channel that we are using. Sure. I have found that, well, with LinkedIn, for instance, um, you know, obviously it's more of a, a professional tone sometimes. And of course, there are limitations of, you know, emojis, not, you know, things, things that you can't do with LinkedIn. But um, it, it's really impressive what you've what you've done with social media. Um, and I think uh, there's so much to learn from that. What, what's very important to, to stress is that any audience you are using, even if tomorrow we would start with TikTok, then you should know that one out of 20 people will have to deal with a disease. So even if you think, well, LinkedIn is more professional, yeah. but you will, you will see people that say, well, I know the story very well. My father, my mother, myself on Twitter, 
on Facebook, and that's we're not speaking about a rare disease. Yeah. If you, if you were speaking to an audience, I give them quite a lot of keynotes, and I'm very happy that we can go now again on stage uh, after two years of mm -hmm. Corona. Uh, a webinar is is not the same thing as uh, okay. the podium, but um, if you stay before an audience and there are 100 people or 200 people, then you know, then you know yes. there are five or 10 people in the room. They know very, very, very well what colon cancer means. Mm -hmm. So that's that's very important to to realize. Absolutely, and and people who are impacted by the disease personally, um, you're right that that they know. So I guess I want to ask you about the people who don't know, because. It is, it is difficult to uh, encourage people to get screened. And, and then we know there are so many barriers. So what is the approach and philosophy that you have um, knowing that colorectal cancer is so preventable, yet it's the screening rate is, you know, varies by country, but it, it's not where it should be for a disease that we can do something about. So how do you approach that in your messaging? Well, I think in the beginning, I tried to give them some numbers, some rough numbers. We can quite be crude if they, they don't realize. I asked them, for instance, how many people do you know? Uh, do you imagine that this year already in Belgium have been diagnosed with colon cancer? And OK, if that's uh, by the end of February, then you have uh, um, that's 59 days and multiply by 23 then you have already a big number. It's over 1,000 new cases. And then the people say, wow, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. And then I ask them, how many people do you think that died already of colon cancer? And then I will tell them, well, nearly 600. And they can't believe this. Right. And then they are sitting there, what are you saying? And then I say that this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. There's still so many people who are dying of colon cancer from a disease that we can prevent. And then I go in the prevent modus and mm -hmm. say so the good news. I should start also with the good news. The good news, if, if you find it in the early stage, then the bad news from the beginning becomes good news since mm -hmm. you have more than 90% chance to, 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 to be cured. And then I got, go to the, the positive uh, thing. And then I ask mm -hmm. them, how many people know the story of the little polyp? How many people know how many uh, time it takes to be, before the polyp becomes cancer? How many people know um, that the initially there are no symptoms? How many people know that the blue ribbon is the symbol of the colon cancer awareness month? How many people know that March, I ask them, which, which month do you think? And some people say, there is no month. Right. So, well, there's a month, even 31 days. <laughs> and, well, you have to... And, Throughout my keynote, I will say, in the normal keynote, I will say seven times, seven times, my three magic words. And my three magic words are, I have one message for you, three words, do the test. And by the end of the keynote, I ask the audience one more time, mm -hmm. all together, and the whole audience will scream, do the test. So I think they go home with a message, mm -hmm. not only with the, the, all the bad numbers that I'm giving, but with the hope. Right. I, I give also examples from people stage four that even 10 years later are in good health. They run mar mar marathons. Um, you have to give them hope. You have to tell them there is a very easy test, the stool test, and that colonoscopy is not uh, a terrible thing. So. Yeah. These are the things that you have to, and then we give some examples of campaigns that we're doing. Um, but I, I know there's still a, a lack of information and a lack of knowledge in the general public, even among general physicians. Yes. And okay, specialists, GI, they, they know now that the best treatment is uh, early detection. Absolutely. And I think that's a lot of what many of the organizations and advocates that are uh, attending our conference today are doing is encouraging those conversations. So ideally uh, your general practitioner 
would be speaking to you about all of the cancer screenings that you should be doing, um, age appropriate, family history, but we know that isn't happening. So um, at the level that that should be. So because of that, we, you know, many organizations are encouraging patients to proactively speak to their healthcare provider. I think that many people and even many physicians don't realize that after lung cancer, colon cancer is number two. Mm-hmm. And when people are spe- speaking about non-smoking related cancers, and then you have to skip lung cancer, then colon cancer is number two. And I always say breast cancer is very important and pink ribbon and think pink is doing great, great, great work. Yeah. They have an advance of 15 years, 10 to 15 years. Mm-hmm. And we have to try to close that gap. And I think that if we continue all together, then uh, we can, and it's, you have to speak about it. You have to speak yeah. with your general doctor. And I also believe very much in the role of the pharmacists. The pharmacist has also a very close relation with his clients. I won't say mm-hmm. patient, but his clients. And they can also help in, and we did some campaigns with uh, pharmacists, mm-hmm. the Blue Pharmacy, um, which are quite, quite effective in raising awareness. It's a great, great point to make. Um, Dr. Coma, you mentioned uh, about sharing patient stories. And I wanted to ask, when it comes to identifying patients uh, and training them to help them effectively share their story, is there any information or tips, any lessons that you've learned over the years that might be helpful for some of our attendees? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that for us is quite important is authenticity. That it, uh, the people, and I don't know why, but uh, we have on our um, website, we have now 73, 73 testimonials, real stories of real patients. And once in a while, we ask on our Facebook page that we are looking for new stories and they come in quite without any effort. And then, okay, I read the content and I leave it. Probably I will add correct grammatically one thing or a point or a comma, but um, we leave the text like it is. And um, I can tell you every time when I'm reading the test, the, the text and I'm checking the text, I also became quite silent. Because mm. every time when I have, re- have to read these stories, say another one. Yeah. And then we put it, we put it like this on our website, we put it on Facebook, on Twitter, and the reaction that's always overwhelming. Since people recognize stories, I can tell my experience, but I think a patient, a, the patient's voice is, is even more trustful than what we are saying. So Dr. Komat, you know, I want to take it back to Brad Pitt for a second, because you said that. Um, that, that even though he did not respond, that was that was not uh, that was not an issue for the campaign, right? That it was still successful. So I'm curious, how do you measure success for your advocacy uh, campaigns and outreach? What are those metrics that you look for? Well, um, it's it's very hard. What what is success and what what is a campaign? Uh, I always say, if we can stop one colon cancer with it then I'm very happy with it. And we receive uh, mails and messages from people. They say, thanks to this campaign, thanks to your keynote, thanks to the action. My father did the test. Even today, even today, I received a mail from an 18 year old girl who was doing a project for us and say, well, I I was able to convince my daddy to to do the test since he wasn't, normally he wouldn't uh, do the test. He did a test, the test was abnormal. He went to the hospital and he took out three big polyps. So thank you very much. That's happened today. The the best success is the the stories that we receive from people. They say, well, thanks to your story, thanks to the campaign, my father, my mother, and they were just in time um, since otherwise probably it was too late. Absolutely. And that's, so, that's, very, that's very rewarding. These are the things, these messages and these stories give us the energy to continue every day. Yes. And fortunately enough, we receive quite a lot of these messages, probably not every day, but at least every week. And this 
gives you the confirmation that what you are doing has impact. And okay, that's very satisfying. Absolutely. And, and you touched on something that um, we've discussed in a, in a different um, panel. Unfortunately, when, when you are in the patient advocacy space, you are going to meet and become friends with a lot of people who unfortunately are going to pass away from this disease. And it's the, the grief that uh, advocates and NGOs, the staff feel is, is very intense. And um, I'm, I'm wondering how, how do you handle that either you know, both personally and with, with your organization Every loss is one too much. Eh? And uh, unfortunately, there are still too many families who are lo losing loved ones due to a disease that can be prevented. And we have also a heart. I have also emotions. Um, and when I was working in the hospital and was losing patients, patients which with I had a, a very good uh, relationship for, for many, many years, I can tell you that the evening when I went home, my wife and me also asked, what happened in the hospital today? Since you are not so, okay, I lost one of my patients. And that's something, um, yeah, uh, you, you have to deal with. And it's, uh, that's the, the bad part of the of campaigning. But um, we receive quite a lot of positive energy of uh, the campaigns. and. A very interesting one that we didn't mention yet, I think that from other people from other countries can be very interesting, that we made a graphic novel, a book. They call it a comic strip in English, but it's not comic, but it's a nice strip. It's a nice book about a 50-year-old man who has the story. Since at the beginning, my idea was to make a movie, a movie like Philadelphia was for AIDS. I wanted to make a movie about colon cancer not a scientific story about colon cancer, but a story from a person who has disease. And, and okay, that's another budget when you want to make a movie. Now we made the, the graphic novel. It's already available in 12 languages. And worldwide, we have now more than 100,000 copies uh, distributed. In Portugal, it has been used as a national campaign. In Italy, the Italian version has also used for a national campaign. We have it in, in French and in, in Turkish and Arabic one is ready now. The Chinese is ready now. So um, if people are interested, they can contact us. It's, it's a very nice, it's a, a booklet, 56 pages. Um, and in English is John, life is worth fighting for is the title. And it's, it's a nice story it, with a happy end. Wow, that's great. Wow, that's that's great. And we'll um, put a link in our attendee hub so that people can um, access it and see that. Do you have any um, parting thoughts that you would share with advocates um, or NGOs that are here today with us? Or is there any lesson that now, um, you know, over a decade later, that you wish that you had had known or um, done when you started out um, with your mission? I would say just do it. Just do it, try out. Keep in mind the two lines that I was speaking about. Um, nothing is impossible. We still have a long way to go, but um, just do it. Just do it and don't be afraid. Um, social media are not that bad as people are thinking. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that, can, that you can use. And I think that an NGO um, should use it since it's an opportunity. It's free. You can you can handle it yourself. Um, and okay, the, the first days, months, probably you don't have what you want to do, but consistency is quite important. And then if we do that together, then we can realize my dream. Since I have a dream to wake up in a world where colon cancer is a rare disease. I would like to wake up one day in a world where nobody has to die from colon cancer. That's so powerful. Thank you so much for, for sharing um, all of your expertise and, and we really appreciate it. And, and thank you, thank you very much.